Micah White's activism began when he was just 13 years old, when he refused to stand for the U.S. Pledge of Allegiance. That drive for change led him to help create the Occupy Wall Street movement. Now the former Adbusters editor has a new view. Protest, he says, is broken. He's the author of The End of Protest, A New Playbook for Revolution, and Micah White joins us now on Life After Occupy and the Future of Protest. Good to meet you. Nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Should yeah. we go down memory lane a little bit here? <laughs> sure. Let's Check go. the monitor out up there. Okay. Go ahead, Shelton. Roll it. I'm homeless. I'm unemployed. I have a college degree. I think that it's going to reach a boiling point very soon because this is just part of the people that are disenfranchised in America. All over the world, we're seeing this kind of uh, demonstration starting. We see it growing. We see people all over the world being more and more aware. And I hope it is coming and starting in the United States. So I hope this is the beginning of something big. That started as an idea and ended up going to 82 countries. So let's start with the idea. Where did it come from? Well, it came from a kind of magical collaboration that I had between Cole Lassen, the founder of Adbusters magazine. Um, and I was an editor at that time. It was my dream job, Adbusters being a Vancouver-based kind of anti-consumerism magazine. And at that time, if you go back to 2011, you know, there was these, this worldwide uprising called the Arab Spring. And the people in Egypt had gone into Tahrir Square and they demanded that Mubarak step down and they resisted thugs sent to beat them up and Mubarak did step down. And then that passion spread to Spain and the people of Spain started going into their squares and they started holding these, these democratic general assemblies. So Kala and I were brainstorming on the phone, how can we bring this to America? And we basically came up with this idea. We wrote a, we wrote a tactical briefing, basically an email to our, to our subscribers of the magazine and said, hey everyone, if we can combine what they're doing in Egypt with what's happening in Spain and bring that to America, we can kick off a revolutionary moment in this country, we can get money out of politics, you know, we can fundamentally change the way things work. And the time was so ripe that within 24 hours of sending that out, activists in New York, they took it up, they ran with it, they made it their own, and, and eventually Occupy Wall Street happened. It created a Twitter account, Occupy Wall Street NYC, and then you're really off to the races after that. Right, yeah, I created the account and I kind of managed that and then someone else created another one. And, and right before the movement, we basically, what, right before it began, you know, we just gave those things over. So I, I sent the very first tweet, I created the first account, but then I gave the password away. And what made you think that this kind of protest was different from anything that had preceded it? I think part of it was the historical situation that was going on, and I think that part of it also was this new shift towards leaderlessness that we were seeing in Spain. That was really inspiring, I think, to see that the people of Spain were kind of doing these consensus-based general assemblies, and they weren't marching, they weren't, you know, but instead they were kind of like manifesting the ideal of democracy. So I think it had some kind of magical thinking about we could manifest a perfect form of democracy and like... But just follow that thread through. What yeah. did you think that you might be able to achieve by doing this? I think that, you know, the sky was the limit. I think that Cullen and I, and I think a lot of people were thinking about regime change in the sense of getting rid of the power of money to influence our democracy, which, you know, our, in 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court said that corporations and unions can give unlimited money to candidates. And we know that the candidate who spends the most wins 90% of the time. And so we were trying to overturn the highest a decision made by the highest court, which, you know, at that time it sounds naive now, but they had toppled the Tunisian dictator. They had toppled the dictator of Egypt. We thought we could topple the financial dictator of America. And how much of that plan do you think actually came true? Well, we didn't achieve that goal for sure, you know, and that's why I call Occupy Wall Street a constructive failure. You know, it failed to achieve what we set out to achieve. But in failing, I think it taught us a lot about the limitations of contemporary activism. It taught us about the limitations of that storyline of activism that we were following and chasing with Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I mean, it's good. A failure, we learn from our failures, but I do think it's important to acknowledge it as a failure so that we can learn from it. You acknowledge it as a failure, but do you think you marched down the road at all? You know, did you get, did you, did you get close to your goal? Did you get somewhere close to your goal? I think that Every social movement, every protest is really like, it's like testing a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that the, the, the great thing about Occupy Wall Street is that we tested a hypothesis that basically has been dominating contemporary activism for so long. That hypothesis being that the best way to get social change is to get millions of people into the streets, rallying around a unified message. We tested that, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that we definitively tested that. I don't think we're going to, I think that we 
we created something that spread to 82 countries, a thousand encampments. I mean, you can't really say it should have been bigger or we should have had more people. No, no it was we, plenty big. It was plenty big, yeah. you know? So, yeah. so, so the beautiful thing is we tested that hypothesis, we tested that idea, and now we know it's not true. So that, I think, is kind of the gift of Occupy. Here's something you wrote in the book. Activism is in crisis. Occupy was the strongest, most sophisticated, and broadly based social movement in 50 years, and we were completely unable to sway the balance of power. Do you know why? Do I know why? You were unable to sway the balance of power. I think it's because there is, and basically our theory of change was wrong. I think that at the, at the very base of it, the people in power don't have to listen to protest. This is, this is I think, <laughs> something that we don't, we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear that because it means maybe we don't live in a democracy. But the fact is that we've been operating under this illusion that there's some sort of law that says, hey, if you can get X number of people into the streets, then, well, because we live in a democracy, your representatives will somehow like have to listen to you. But you know that- Well, because it sometimes does work. It seems to work in some cases, and it's very strange. Like, I think that it sometimes works when it justify, when it works to justify a pre-existing tendency within the government. For example, like they, they kind of overthrew Mubarak because Mubarak stepping down was kind of what the Western geopolitical system wanted. And so they could point to the, student, the protesters and they could say like, look, you have people in the streets, you have to listen to them, you need to step down. But when those exact same tactics were basically imported into America, Obama completely ignored the movement. He didn't mention Occupy Wall Street until it was evicted from Zuccotti, until basically he was sure that it was done is when he started to kind of talk about it. Zuccotti, that park in New York City. Right, the park that we, the first encampment, you mm -hmm. know? So I think that, that that gives us this kind of, that's one of the reasons activists make a mistake is because we, we start to see that sometimes protests seem to, to work, but it, it seems like that's in the times when it kind of, justifies a pre-existing disposition of the, of the government. Well, I know when we covered it here on this station that one of the things that, that, um, that occasionally we discussed and found frustrating was w when you would try to interview the leader of Occupy, there was no such thing. And when you tried to get the single message that came out of Occupy, there was no such thing. Have you come to the conclusion that that was a mistake? I mean, I, it's, it's a difficult question because, th like I'm saying, I think that we were testing a hypothesis. And so at that time, you know, you have to go, you have to realize you can't just like, you're, you're dealing with pre-existing culture. And so at that time, Adbusters put forward this idea of the tactical briefing. And we said to people, you know, when we made, also made a poster, and the top of the poster says, what is our one demand? And we told people, let's go down to Wall Street, let's come up with our one demand, and let's, we thought, let's make that one demand, you know, set up, set up a presidential commission to get money out of politics. Mm. So, but, but the thing is, I was based in Berkeley, California, Kala and Adbusters was based in Vancouver. So when the idea went to New York City, it was taken up by people who believed in something called prefigurative anarchism, which I had never heard of. And in, under that paradigm, you don't make demands. Instead, you, you build the ideal society within the you know, microcosm of the protests. And, and so it wasn't, it wasn't so much a mistake as it was the only way it could have gone. But the notion of putting the needs of the 99% front and center, you did do that. Do right. you take some satisfaction out of that? I think that the beautiful thing of Occupy is that it did give us this idea that of horizontalism and leaderlessness, that we should no longer invest the will of our movements into single individuals, mm. and that there is a kind of power in the group, which is, which is really an idea that we kind of got from Spain. You know, they also, with their consensus-based assemblies, it's not something we just made up, it was something that was kind of floating around the global movement. I think that was beautiful. I think it's true. And I think that leaderlessness wasn't a complete failure, but the way in which it was practiced during Occupy with a very strict consensus based, you know, it paralyzed us. We mm. could not come up with, we could not come to complex decisions. We, in fact, like you're saying, we could not put forward articulate spokespersons because people like Kala and I and other articulate spokespersons would recuse ourselves. In fact, we would say we're not taking any any interviews. Mm. And there was a kind of tendency to tear down any potential leaders or any charismatic individuals. So. The way in which leaderlessness was practiced, I think, was possibly not correct, but the, the ideal, I think, is still something that we need to figure out and chase after. You know? Here's another quote from the book. Activism, you say, is at a crossroads. We can stick to the old paradigm, keep protesting in the same ways and hope for the best, or we can acknowledge the crisis, embark on wild experimentation, and prepare for revolution. Okay, I gotta know what the, some of that means in there. Wild experimentation means what? So I think, you know, Activism and, and protest is basically in a, in a paradigm crisis. And when, you're, and when a crisis is in paradigm, or when a paradigm is in crisis, mm -hmm. you can't just, you can't just um, 
the only way to break out of it is to replace it with a new, a new paradigm. You know, so we can know that protest is broken, but the only way to fix protest is to figure out, well, what are the other ways of doing the protest that would break us out of this? And the way to get there is only through experimentation. So I think that we need to, you know, one of the things I talk about in my book is basically, are there other theories of social change than just direct action, the idea of putting our human bodies into the streets? Are there other ways of conceiving of social change? And would those other theories give us new tactics, new ways of thinking about doing social protests? I got a radical idea for you. Okay. Why don't you run for office? <laughs> I think that is something that, we, that activists need to start Take thinking about. Take it over. Take yeah. over. I absolutely, agree. I absolutely agree with you. And I think, so if you look at what happened in Spain, their movement arose in 2011 around the time of an election. Mm -hmm. And at that time they said, you don't represent us, we're not gonna get engaged in politics. And of course they didn't vote. So what happens? The right wing sweeps into power. But if you look at what's happening in Spain now, that very, those very same protesters have built a social movement that's also a political party. It's called Podemos, and they are winning elections. So I agree with you that North American activists need to learn our lesson, which is, yeah, social movements need to start winning elections. Have you given up on activism altogether because of the experiences related to Occupy? No, absolutely not. You know, I started activism when I was 13. Activism is my life. But instead, I do acknowledge that we are in a period when protest has become ineffective. And so those, when you're in one of those periods, you have to, the only way to break out of it is, it is to acknowledge it. And, you know, it's a recurring phenomenon within activism to be within one of these periods. I think between the anti-war movement of 2003 and the start of Occupy Wall Street, that was also a period of the end of protest. There basically was no real movements happening in America, at least between those years. So, but it does, I don't find it discouraging so much as I find it, it's a little bit exciting, you know, and I think it's hard to like get people you know, to realize that we need to stop our old patterns. But once we do, I mean, something like Occupy Wall Street could emerge just, you know, in a week from now. It, it's, hmm. it's, that, it's that quick. People didn't, it feels very much now like it did before Occupy in the sense that no one believed Occupy was going to happen. They didn't think it was a good idea. They thought protest, you know, was, I think, broken in a certain sense then too, you know. So we can break out of this period, but it does kind of... Follow my twisted logic here, if you will. Okay. Can you take some credit in the fact that Bernie Sanders is as popular as he is right now? Because in effect, he's running a campaign on a lot of the themes that you guys raise, namely, the system is crooked, there's too much political money in it, uh, the 99% and their agenda is being completely disregarded for the corporate agenda in America. Now, he's not going to win the nomination, but he's having a hell of a run. You take any credit in that? I think that, yeah, I do. I mean, I think that Occupy Wall Street, though, can take credit for the rise of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in the sense that both of these candidates represent people who are desperate for social change. They're desperate for change. We haven't solved any of the ec economic inequalities that created our movement, the Occupy movement. But at the same time, they are suspicious of the old protest methods. They're looking for new, new things. But, you know, I think my critique of both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders is that they are still a regression to that old leader leader based style. Mm -hmm. It's still the it's still the system of like putting my hopes into this singular individual. But they want to speak for the voiceless. Right. That's one that's that is one thing those two very different guys have in common. Right. They want to, they want to represent people who feel underrepresented. Right. And I think that they are both um, th the result of acknowledging that there is this passion among the 99% that is willing to kind of that wants someone who's gonna say, I'm gonna smash things up and make things different. And that, and so I think that, um, yeah, I think that it's, it, is, it is a beautiful thing, but at the same time, I'm a little bit wary of, the, of them. Yeah. Well, let me pick up on the smash things up, because you know we have seen it uh, in the Trump rallies in particular, there has been some violence. And this is from David Smith in The Guardian, who wrote about that, particularly the one in Chicago that was, had to be called off because it got out of control. He said, the Chicago intervention, rooted in the city's activism against social and racial injustice, was isolated and not intended to launch a movement. But like last year's student protests over racism on college campuses, it has the potential to spread and gain its own momentum, especially with social media linking common causes. From Black Lives Matter to trade unions to LGBT groups, there are many overlapping interests in halting the Trump bandwagon. Um, what are the Trump rallies, in your view, saying about the nature of public protest today in America? You mean the attempts by protesters to kind of disrupt them? Well, I guess part of that, but mostly the, the, the fact that um, these have been, I mean, these have been massive events. Yeah. You get 35,000 people show up in Montgomery, Alabama, you know, to hear Donald Trump speak. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a calm protest, but it's a protest movement of sorts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just, I think it comes back to this, to this 
People, I mean, on, I, I think one of the mistakes of Occupy Wall Street is we didn't link up enough with the Tea Party, for example. Mm. But, but you know, you have to, the Tea Party movement kind of preceded Occupy Wall Street. So there is this kind of, there are, there's a growing number of people in America who realize that only some sort of radical, revolutionary transformation is going to get them the solutions that they need. And I think that politicians are, you know, Trump and Bernie Sanders are, tump- are tapping into that, you know. So I think that, but at the same time, I think that, that, that it's really, it's really going to be up to social movements that can figure out how to mobilize that same discontent in order to swing elections. If, I think if, for example, Occupy started in September and ended around, in, you know, was evicted in November. American elections happen in November. Had there been an election during the height of Occupy Wall Street, we could have totally shifted the course of that election. And so I think that what I would say to dis- people who are going into the Trump rallies and kind of disrupting is we need to think bigger than that. I think that disrupting the Trump rallies is like, that's small game in terms of activism. I mean, mm-hmm. any activist can do that with 20 friends. Yeah. What's bigger than that, though, is to figure out how would you build a social movement that could beat Donald Trump in an election? Rather than trying to disrupt him, let's eclipse him. Let's use that kind of fire that he's tapping into that we basically created. I mean, we created that intensity, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think that that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm, I'm leaning towards. Ironically, he's spending the least amount of money out of all the candidates. Isn't so it's that, not always money. Yeah, isn't that it's interesting? It's not always money. Yeah. But you talk, let me, let's just finish up on this. You talk about revolution. And, you know, for some people, the word revolution is a very scary word. Uh, and I, I guess I need to know, when you talk about revolution, are you talking about overthrowing the republic? You want a different form of government? Uh, what are you talking about? That is a, that's a really good question. I agree with you. I think that one of the fascinating things about contemporary politics is that we have become maybe, to, we've started to believe that maybe revolution isn't possible and maybe it's not even desirable. I think that a lot of people on the left looking at Stalin, Mao, all communist yeah, revolution. Lots of people die when you have res- revolution. Absolutely, yeah. they, they have turned, they have been, we start to see them now as kind of a negative thing perhaps. Mm-hmm. But I think the core thing to understand is that revolution is part of the process of human civilization. Revolutions are necessary to getting us to the next step in human civilization. So when I talk about revolution, what I'm really talking about is a change in legal regime. Whether that is a, you know, a new laws that, that get money out of politics or a fundamental reorientation of the government, I think that the core idea is that we need to put, it needs to be that the people, the 99%, are the ones who decide on the laws, that, let, that choose the way that the government shall be. But I don't think that revolution today is going to look like any revolution in the past. Revolutions mm-hmm. never look like. The mm-hmm. Russian Revolution didn't look like the French Revolution. You know, and so Occupy didn't look like the Russian Revolution. And I think that people who think that, the, that it's going to be some sort of armed insurrection in the streets and all this kind of stuff, they're just living in the past. No, it's going to be much more like, much more like some sort of beautiful kind of awakening like Occupy, where all of a sudden people are just like, they switch their allegiance. That's how I think it's going to happen. You know, mm-hmm. And all of a sudden it's just like, oh yeah, we don't really believe in this government anymore. And what we do believe is that this social movement is capable now of governing and that if it does govern, it's going to be better for all of us. So I think it's, I think it's going to be nonviolent and, and largely kind of, um, kind of like a spiritual and beautiful experience, kind of like a, an awakening more than like, a, than like a struggle, you know? When you do it, we look forward to covering it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for making the trip in from Oregon today to be with us tonight here on TVO. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Micah White, The End of Protest, A New Playbook for Revolution. Great to meet you. Thanks, Micah. Wonderful. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.